And I'm going to have um, Terry join us because I think she's already here for our next half an hour. Good friend of mine. Just love this gal so much. Hi. Hi, Terry. Um, I love this springy background hi. for you. So, well, you know, I'm in Vermont, so you got to make your flowers. Yeah, you got to make your flowers. We have them already in California. Everything's in bloom. Um, it's awesome. It's also making my allergies go nuts. Um, so, Terry, before we launch into your whole um, session and everything that you want to share, you were just part of listening in on what I was just talking about with hybrid logistics. So, trying to craft the human intersection moment more premium wise. What are your thoughts? Cause you're coming at this from the virtual learning world. As you think about the physical schooling aspect, what do you think? <laughs> well, you know, I'm a national board certified teacher and I have been for over 20 years. I was an early certifier. And we sort of have a saying in our group, a person who does the work does the learning. And that's what I thought about a lot, listening to most of your presentation, is I feel like in a lot of ways as educators, particularly teachers, we've taken on the bulk of the work of learning. And therefore, we learn a lot. But I'm not sure sometimes how much our students learn. Mm. Um, one of the things I'm going to talk about in a few minutes is time management because we have not taught them how to manage their time for things. And we see it this year with kids who are not in school all day. The work's not done. They don't show up for the Zoom because they forgot there's all these different things because we've been doing that work for them. And there were a number of things I saw in there. A lot of individualization. We've got to remember that's got to come from the student as much as it has to come from the teacher. Yeah. And that's the real definition of personalization, a teacher individual, right. but a student personalizes. You know, what you just said is really um, striking because we've had a few of these conversations, but this, this well goes very deep. You and I could probably talk about this for an hour, Terry. Probably. Um, and that is student agency was kind of squashed from the time they hit kindergarten until the pandemic, right? Like whatever age they are, it's like, no, you don't get to decide anything. You don't even right. get to decide when you get to go to the bathroom, right? You have right. to, um, and your body routed, like in terms of like line up here, go over here, sit here, don't do that. No squirming, no talking to each other. Now here, read this. Now everybody together now. It, it And now, okay, now like get yourself online when you're supposed to, good luck. You know, go to the right resources on your own, right. all your own stuff on your own. I mean, you know, it's almost like we sort of suppressed individual agency forever and ever. Now, now we just threw them to the wolves. Like, why, why aren't they showing up? What's happening? Like, <laughs> I think we were so worried about giving them all the support they need to be able to learn that we were doing the work. And you're right. We squashed student agency as a result is they just talk to the average high school student. They'll tell you they go where they're told to go. They do what they're supposed to do while they're there. And when the bell rings, they get up and go wherever they're supposed to go next. They don't have any thought involved, no. nor do they have any decisions. Yeah. And so we're actually, I would also, you know, Senator Howard Stevenson said this to me, Terry. He said, we're witnessing the death of whole group. But I think what you're pointing out right now is another, is another huge revolution that people aren't really recognizing it for what it is right now. And that is we're seeing the rebirth of agency. And, and it's being forced um, because when you're supposed to be learning a lot asynchronously online, you have to get yourself up. You have to go do it. You have to find the right stuff. You have to join in. You have to read the stuff and, and you have to drive yourself. This could yes. be the best thing ever for economic development, right? Because yes. now everybody's going to graduate and going, oh, what am I, what am I doing next? I'm driving myself all the time on everything. This could be huge. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, I've been teaching a long time and I've sort of seen this trend as it has developed. But really this year is the year I stopped and thought about what this really meant. And you're right. I've come to that same feeling that whose class is this? It's not my class. It's your class and your class and your class. 
And really, do we all have to walk in the same path, taking a right foot and then a left foot together? Um, one of the things I've often complained about is we move children along in school by date of manufacture. Yeah. And I've been teaching, I taught middle school for a long time. I'm going to tell you right now, the average seventh grade boy and the average eighth grade girl are in two completely different places. But we shove them all in a seven, eight classroom. Yeah. And say, we're all going to do this at the same time. And that's not fair to anybody. No, I'm all over this. I'm, I am so mind melded with you right now. Um, <laughs> well, Terry, my dear, I'm going to let you um, take over for this next, what is it? Half an hour we've given you and, and just let it rip and share with us because I know you're so innovative. I've always been really impressed with you. I miss you. I wish I could see you in person. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and turn my camera off and give it over to you. Okay. Okay. Do you want oh. me to stay on so you can do a share? Do you want to share screen? No, I have no slides. Oh, good. Okay, well then I'm gonna I'm gonna remain um, here then for this. Okay. I, I might need to take a little quick break on the video for the next thing, but um, let's just have this conversation. Okay, so line us up. Pre-pandemic, going into it, what happened? Well, um. I have been teaching online. This is my 12th year of teaching online classes. Mm -hmm. So I've had a lot of experience with students as online learners, both, both before this and after this. And even before the pandemic, I had realized that the biggest problem online students have in a full online program is getting their work done. Well, so yeah, I started that's, to ask that's what myself, everybody said yeah. about distance mm -hmm. learning for years. It's like, no, the kids aren't succeeding. Distance learning doesn't work. Okay, well, listen, did you like check on them? Did anybody make sure they were getting online? Is there any sort of dashboard? And then they're like, no, you know, they just we wait. Here's the oh. other thing. It's not even about checking on them. It's teaching them how to do this by themselves, which is what I'm going to talk about a little bit more here is teaching them how to manage themselves to go to school. Okay. And I think what will happen if we actually start to do this with students, I also think college retention rates are going to shoot up. Oh, yeah. The average freshman that drops out of school is the same problem the average online student who doesn't complete. It's that somehow things got out of their control. I always believe that a student sincerely wants to make this happen and do well. Yeah. I always work with that assumption. I've never had a student yet that really didn't care, no matter what they say. So if you think about they want to do this, what do I give them as a teacher to let them do it? Yeah. That's a huge shift for teachers, by the way. It's really hard to let go of that control because they are not all going to do it like you want them to the first time. Mm -hmm. because that's your way and you have to learn to open your brain up to the idea that they might have a way that's better for everybody but certainly they may have a way that's better for them than what my idea was so first thing you've got to do as a teacher is to start to let go of the fact that that child's education is actually my responsibility I have always said education has to come from a team. It has to come from the student. It has to come from support from home and it has to come from school. I think we've shifted all that to school and I think we need to start to shift it back. Which I'm not going to talk about this today, but I will say it has occurred to me. We haven't taught parents how to do this either. Yeah, but during the pandemic, there were so many superintendents and other execs who told, told us on these calls, wow, the parents really like got into it. And a mm -hmm. lot of the parents were so into it, they were actually finally appreciating schools. Yes. You know, before it was all like attack, attack, attack. You, you guys know. are horrible, blah, blah, blah. Now it's like, hey, I really get you now. Like, I, can I help you more? <laughs> so, yeah. you know. Yeah, I read a, an article the other day. I'm just checking my time an article the other day and this woman was talking about how difficult it was to work from home 
and teach her three children and manage and be sure they would get all the work done. And I thought, you're not even the teacher. You're not constructing curriculum. You're not grading and commenting on anything. You're simply basically sitting there to answer simple questions, maybe, and be sure they're doing their work. And it's hard. Yeah. 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 So stop and think about what teaching really is for a minute. It's hard. And I think we make it look easier than it is. So people think it's a lot easier than it is. Yeah. But it it really, you know, in the start of it, so many um, schools, their, their, their perception of what was going to happen was take brick and mortar and slide it online. It's still lecture, lecture, lecture. And wow, that doesn't work. Um, you oh, can't, the lecture you can't do five hours of lecture with a seven-year-old online. You'll uh, like, no, no. <laughs> and the lecture piece, there are two things. First, when we moved to hybrid here, a lot of schools felt like they had to have their kids show up for classes on Zoom. Oh, yeah. So they would that's, schedule that's at least sixty percent of Americans doing that. Yeah, a lot of my students had three days a week from this time to this time. They had to be on Zoom for yeah. an hour for this class. And I said, "Well, what do y'all do?" Said, well, mostly the teacher talks. Now that is not actually what we do at school. Yeah. If they were in my classroom for an hour, if I lectured, it might be a five or ten minute thing. We'd have a group discussion, and then they would have time to work. My students complained to me this fall that they did not have time to get their work done because they had to show up for all this stuff. Do you think some of that is the perception that while you're online, it's like you're on TV and you have to keep being like a little actor, actress all the time? Um versus maybe we get on the call like right now if we just went dead silent and you were working on something i was working on something we're still together but nobody's talking mm-hmm. nobody's even looking at each other much but then we're all like working along and we're togetherness and then somebody raises their hand hey i need help with this like they're not doing that they think about no. it as tv they think of it as tv and i think we have to think through synchronous sessions What's the purpose? Yeah, if you yeah. don't have a clear purpose for a synchronous session with students, don't ask them to show up. If you don't have a clear purpose, I can't say what my purpose is for this block of time. They're not going to know what my purpose was either. So exactly what use was that? Yeah, but don't lectures, you- I do lectures in my classes, by the way. My lectures are video- all videoed. They're in the class so the student can watch them as many times as they want to whenever they're ready to watch them. And my rule is they are never more than five minutes. Two minutes is better. Yeah. Do you think, though, because I kind of I I kind of toying with this idea that it might be also helpful if you're not going to be if you're not going to do one of those, that maybe there's separate Zoom rooms that that are like study halls where all the kids could be together. Maybe there's some sort of paraprofessionals overseeing it to make sure there's nothing weird going on, but um, it's silent unless some kid wants to ask some other kid something or, Hey, can you, Johnny, can you help me with this? Cause I don't get it. Um, but it's togetherness. Cause some schools have told us they've created like dance groups and gaming groups. And like, you know, I, I would love to be one of those dancers on zoom, you know, like, Hey, let's do this. Um, it, you know, there's a, there was togetherness in the physical environment that is missing. Uh-huh. And the recreation of that digitally has to be thought through. I haven't heard as many as I want to hear talk about synchronous asynchronicity. <laughs> you <know>? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and there's definitely a, a spot for the synchronous I'll say in my mind, it's more about socialization than it is about education, if that makes sense. A yeah. kid can always send me an email and ask a question. And well, yeah. I do what you were talking about with teachers. After 10 o'clock at night, everything's on silent. And if you email me or a text or whatever after 10, you'll get a response from me in the morning. I 
just tell my students that I don't care. You can send me one at three in the morning if that's when you're working. And I work with a lot of high school kids. Sometimes they are. Wow. But understand these are my working hours and this is the time in which you will get a response from me. That's wise. Yeah. Um, and because they know that, I don't really get complaints from them because they know as soon as it's my work time, they will get a response. Good. Now, what happened when the pandemic happened with you guys? Did it sort of blow you up? Did every superintendent start calling you and be like, hey, um, <laughs> we went from about 600 students a semester. We enrolled about 5,000 last fall. <laughs> But we created a lot of different programs. So a lot of those students were actually still based in their school. And we created programs that schools could use to deliver services. But we also, because Vermont schools are very small, we had to do some things like one teacher may actually be serving three schools. I teach psychology. A lot of schools don't have a full psychology class. When you've got a graduating class of 30 all of them don't want to take psychology. But when three or four schools would pool together and use me as the teacher, then there was a full class. And you do need those classes because the kids have to be able to interact with each other. So um, interesting because when I talk about the extra liminal future, in other words, don't think of yourself as a leader in a school in a district within the <laughs> confines of who am I going to hire, who's going to sit in my brick and mortar buildings. Think outside your limits, extra liminal. Can yes. I hire Terry to do this and this? And that person way over there to do these three things. So in other words, that mentality of how I'm running my enterprise, my brand as a leader in schools or districts is I don't have to do it all like the old fashioned way. I can, I can create a, I can create a matrix like the movie, like not in a bad way, but you know, I, I can use people from anywhere. It's awesome. Yeah. So you're yeah, we actually have to what we heard from Florida virtual school, by the way, and all the big yes, online, like Edison I'm learning sure. too, right? Like the big online shops, massive. And the, and the ones in the homeschooling arena too, massive. Yeah. Yes. Massive. Yeah. And I think I'm fortunate because I'm in Vermont. We're so small that the Agency of Education actually sponsored this. They encouraged us. They gave us the money to move to capacity because they wanted the service to be available to the schools, um, including paying us to make available to them an LMS that they could use for free. So any school can use can link into this LMS for free because we've paid for it. And I think that's really helpful. We've also had a lot of teachers that are starting to think online might be really cool. And yeah. so that's, that's been a really plus of it, I think. But I really think when I teach my methods classes, for people who are prepping to be online teachers, my conversation with them is a good teacher is a good teacher. Yeah. If you're a good teacher, you can be a good online teacher. But how you do that teaching may be very different, that you have to stop and think through your pedagogy again. For somebody who's been teaching as long as I am, that took a little bit of time to think through because I was pretty set, you know, I had everything yeah. worked out. This is how I do this. I know exactly how I teach mapping in U.S. history. And all that, I had to stop and rethink. I feel like I'm a better classroom teacher for having been an online teacher because it has taught me how to focus my responses to students differently. So we talked about synchronous and asynchronous. I will say that contact between the teacher and the student is still really critical. Yeah. So in my classes, for example, every single one of my students has to meet with me for half an hour once a month. Good. One to one. I got off a conversation with Luke when I logged on to here. And Luke's in the seventh grade. And what our conversation was, was, hey, last semester you were always behind and now you're caught up. Tell me what happened. And we talked about his time management. And I'm going to segue in there for a minute. 
So what I say to my students who are working at home is I say, look, at school, we did your time management for you. We didn't say, if you've got math today, work till your math is done. And if you don't have math due tomorrow, don't worry about it. We don't do that. We say learning on a regular schedule. I explain to my students that all memory occurs with repetition over time. They're not going to learn it if they do all their weekly lessons on Saturday. They're yeah, not going to yeah. learn it. And they start to listen to this. It takes a while to work them to it. Yeah. My goal ultimately is to make them make a schedule at home. So with my last student, he's going to be working now from 1230 to two, three days a week to stay caught up with this class. That was his decision. He picks the time, he picks the days, and he picked the amount of time per day. I was trying to do him an hour a day. He said, no, I need an hour and a half. Now, one thing I want to throw out, because there's a lot of conversation about screen time. All of my students, I tell them, when you do your schedule, you schedule in a 10-minute break once an hour. You get up, get away from your computer, and look outside and walk around. They constantly tell me that was the saving grace. I said, you'll focus better, but it also breaks the whole blue light cycle in their head a little bit. And everybody, by the way, should do that. All of you listening, get up once an hour and walk around for 10 minutes. You'll be a different person at the end of the day. But mm -hmm. I have them make a schedule out. And then once they get into their daily schedule, we have the conversation about, you know, if you go in like Monday and plan what you were going to get finished each day and just wrote it on your schedule, that would all be scattered out and we wouldn't have to worry about it. And they're all over it. Yeah. I have never had a student who actually used this that did not come back to me at some point and tell me it saved them, that that was the way they were able to stay caught up with their work. They feel successful. If you get behind, you're still in control because you know when you're going to have time to work on this. And that takes a huge amount of stress off of kids. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So stress is why I started doing this with them because they're too stressed. And I thought about how can I alleviate some of that? Well, the biggest stress most students have in school is I don't have my work done. Yeah. And I, I think you've pointed out something really interesting about the dynamic here. And that is that the loss of the classroom and the physical bodies in the room, really what was happening with teachers is that they felt a loss of control um, because, and let's face it, physical schools is control mechanism. It yes. routes you around. Um, and now, yeah, students need their own sense of agency. But I also think, and I'll ask you your observation on this point that I don't know if it's a condition of aging and just sort of calming down a little bit, but there's a certain level of teachers in their sort of maturity forward of doing this often enough um, where they start out and they're, they're like, they're a little bit control freaks, you know, they're, you know, and I always have found that to be a situation where they're not themselves confident in themselves enough. So they're projecting and, or their content. Or pressure from the outside. That's it's true. got incredibly bad when no child left behind went in and you got, your school got punished as soon as you couldn't make a score. And ultimately, who did that come down on? That came all the way down to teachers, that pressure. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know administrators felt a lot of pressure. Yeah. But it was sort of from the top. Teachers felt that kind of pressure every single day with every single class. And the only way I could guarantee that you were going to be able to answer the right ones on your multiple choice test was if I had control of the classroom. Yeah, drill and kill. Drill uh, and kill. And that's not my job now. My yeah. job is not to make sure that you can answer the right one on a multiple choice test. My job is to help you, not teach you, help you learn your content information 
and how it applies to you and the rest of the world. When they make those connections, that higher order thinking skill, not only do they remember it better, but it makes sense to them. We hear kids, why do I have, I teach English. Why do I have to take English? I'm not going to be a writer. Good question. Good question. They see no relevance. If I can't show them the relevance of this content, they're not really going to learn it. And that's a huge shift because that takes time. Yeah. And we're always, I I was looking at that schedule where you had all the little blocks laid out. And I thought, yeah, I've been there, done that. It's awful because I don't know exactly how much time it's going to take this particular group of kids for me to get all of them to this standard because they're not together. They're on a spectrum and always will be. Yeah. And the schedule thing was just awful. And I think what's been really interesting to me and is, is that this pandemic is a revolution of tra- and transformation in, in every direction. This is one of them, the, the, yeah. the rebirth of student agency, but also the fact that so many superintendents have said to me that, because I asked during the, the April, May timeframe last year, as this whole thing got started, I'm like, are some of the kids doing better in, in remote? And everyone said, well, yeah, there's a bunch of kids that are just really excelling. They love it. They were like sitting in the back of the classroom all the time, super quiet before. And now they're like chatty Kathy online, blah, 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 blah. And they're just comfortable as heck, right? Um, and then some of them, like you're saying, they need more time in math. Mm-hmm. But in the asynchronous remodeling of this all, they just jumped up a whole grade in reading. Mm-hmm. So their time that they can be using to spend on additional materials, this is where the individualization comes in by the teachers, is higher for math than it is for reading. Mm-hmm. Right? So they, you can just sort of, you know, alter the times things yes. that are happening because as we do this remodeling of everything, we are watching every kid is different. Some of them need way more time on some stuff than some other stuff. Mm-hmm. It looks like we had two of our superintendents join us already. Hi, guys. Hi, Hi. how are you? Hi, Hi, good. Terry and I are going to wrap up here in a couple minutes, and then we'll we'll have you guys, like, you're going to be on deck for a, a while. Super, oh, wow. Yeah, super glad to have you. But you can put us on, um, you can turn your video off and put us on mute for, like, uh, five, six minutes now. And then and then we'll call you back on. So or you can all, stay. Get your get your glass of water and all that other stuff. Okay, cool. Um, all right. So, so, so what's really you had a really good point. Okay. I just want to throw out that's exactly what the student I talked about did. This yeah. was an English class. And in general, three hours a week is enough to do the work. I know about how long it takes most students. Well, the homeschoolers t- say that all the time. There's homeschool moms all over the internet saying it only takes me two and a half hours to get all my kids' work done. What you know? What are these schools doing with my kid for all the rest of the time? Is it just like you know what is happening? Uh. <laughs> yeah, but he decided he needed more like four and a half hours a week to work. And he chose that. That means that extra half an hour that I wasn't going to have him do. He's not only going to do it, but he's doing it because he wants to do it. So I don't have to have control. I don't have to be there because it's his choice. And I always tell them, look, give it two weeks. If it doesn't work, email me. We'll make a new plan. That's awesome. So they never feel trapped. Most of them, their first plan actually works great for them. But sometimes I've worked with one for a whole semester till we get what they need for a plan. Well, I really like this. Um, I, I, know, I know you know, and and um, Chris McMurray on our staff at the Learning Council's former superintendent from Evergreen, he's going to talk about the new digital learning experience standards by the Edu Jedi. I think I'm, I'm going to bring up with him putting you on one of the working meetings because okay. your point of time management student agency is not specifically spelled out in the student standards yet. Uh, And I think we need to add it in the edit meeting because obviously this is a transitional moment um, for student agency. uh Yeah, it's huge. 
I, I almost wish there was like a whole set of modular software to teach student agency because literally all of American kids in traditional public have had it ripped out of them from a young age. And they're like, what? I'm supposed to be where online? What time management? I just physically walked every time the bell rang, right? Uh -huh. The bell out. rang and I knew where to go. Yeah. After the third day of school, I knew where to go anyway. Yeah, I never did in Northern Minnesota where I went to school because we had what was called blue days and white days, which were our school colors. And I was always like, what day is it? Where am I supposed to be? Because it was different day to day. Uh, I was lost. In Lock the scheduling. I have a lot of kids like that in the face-to-face -face school. And you know what they do, what you did probably, they follow their friends. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm like, what? where do we go now? I don't know. Follow them. I'm in class with them wherever they go. Yeah. Some kid in the class, I always knew everything about what was going on. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is interesting. Well, I love your comments about this time management and also the, the issues of teacher retraining, you know, how, how they can calm down and just let things, they don't, they don't have to be on TV all day. They, they can, they can let asynchronous occur. They're kind of all becoming little Socrates now, you know, like, Here's yes. a question. What do you think? You figure it out. Um, which I think is beautiful because now digital systems, and I don't know if you guys have gone so far beyond your LMS to get into a lot of digital objects people could use for your districts, but this is a huge point. Like maybe you should let the students surf around in there and figure out the, you know, fall of Rome on their own. You know, like I think there's a future there. Yeah. One thing I've noticed you say that it's funny. My students, when they're working on their online class, tend to not use anything else on the internet. They'll oh, email you're me and ask me a question and I'm like, well, I'm just going to look that up. I'll send you the URL, but all I did was write what you told me in the search engine. It's okay with me if you go do a little research. I'm okay with research. So, yeah, it's just funny to watch them now because before the group of students that I had was always very self-selected because online was just an option. This semester, I've had a lot of kids that they didn't really feel like they had other options. Yeah. And so it's a different group of students. It's been helpful for me just because it points out to me what those differences between face-to-face -face and online really are. And I'm sold on, on online learning. I think yeah. it's an option every student should have because there's things kids can do online that you're not going to be able to make happen in a regular classroom. No, but I don't even want to call it online learning or distance learning anymore, Terry. No. I feel it so misnames it and mischaracterizes it because it is human in many respects. It's oh, yeah. a different construct, right? It's not the old days of online learning where a lot of kids failed. You, <sighs> you know, you I taught those. <laughs> Yeah, that's you remember where they days? all got together in one room and watched TV. That was yeah, all yeah. my learning. Yeah, yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I think we're in a different time period. And I'm, I'm grateful that you brought up all the things that you brought up. Um, I think it's going to make a great video for the whole national audience to view everything that you said. And uh, you've been doing this long enough to know, so you can say it with, you know, some certainty. Um, so, any last comments you want to make? No, except I hope that people, if this is your first one of these sessions with Learning Council, I'm going to strongly recommend you try them again because all of them are good. I try to get on them as much as possible. And fortunately, you also record them because I have a meeting with a student at um, three, so I'm not going to be able to stay for everything today. <laughs> one of my 30-minute face-to-faces is in a half an hour, so yeah. But, um, okay, well, thank you for taking time right. out of your busy schedule and sharing with us all that you've learned and, and your perspective. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. Take thank care. You. Okay, bye, Terry. Bye. All right. Firefly Computers and Trinity 3 Technology are now Trafera. And at Trafera, we don't measure success by how many devices we sell to schools. We measure success by how those devices are used to transform the learning experience. Today, we are at Hayworth Unified School District and we want to share their story with you.
Our planning was definitely different this year. We spent the summer planning for the unknown. Um, we didn't know if we would be in person or virtual or a combination of the two. Our focus was on preparing staff and families for a constantly changing learning environment. What's wonderful is the opportunities that the technology provides. Um, you know, with COVID, we're not able to get out and experience field trips this year. Um, and so we can bring those learning experiences into the classroom. What we did in Google Earth is, so you, we would travel to like a ton of places like um, Japan or China, the Eiffel Tower, Washington DC and see all those monuments, the Liberty Bell, the pyramids, pyramids and like all kinds of other stuff. You could maybe even see your home. So we did this project where um, we pretended to go to different places and we made these digital, digital postcards that we could send to our friends and family. The two companies that came together to form Trofero were really known for not only our educational hardware, but also our warranty services and our white glove services. And of course, we bring all of that historical knowledge and that expertise to the new company. And I think we do it better than what we ever have before. But we're using this as a platform to really rally around educators and empower them with the skills that they need through professional learning and through digital curriculum to be able to provide these kinds of learning experiences to students. Moving forward, I feel like every teacher is more confident, better equipped, and more effective at educating students using the technology that we have. And when students are learning, that's all that really matters. Trafera, transforming learning experiences.